Hey guys, good afternoon. We are going to continue today with replication. Um, we have um, a short thing on the methods of, rep of replication and then we'll go over the CAP theorem. So, um, all right, so when we're doing replication of data into multiple replicas that store the different copies of the data, hopefully in sync, um, we can do passive replication or active replication, okay? So let's talk about passive replication first. Okay. Um, in, pass, in a passive replication system, we will have some set of clients. Maybe we have client one that will issue a write to a master node. Okay, so we have a master. And then we have some set of replica slaves. So we'll have here slave one, and then here we will have slave two. And whenever a write is issued to the master, the master does this replication or replicates that data to the different slaves, okay? Then following a write, we can have a read by another client, let's call it client two, which will read from one of those replicas the latest data. Okay, so how would you replicate this system, right? So let's say that we have the following operation, C1 write x the value of one, and then we have our operation of C2 read x, okay? So basically the same scenario as above. And the question for you guys is think about how knowing what you know about distributed system would you actually implement um, this, okay? Good time to pause the lecture, okay? Um, so here's some options. Um, you could have uh, some system for electing a master, okay? Maybe you have a leader election system that elects a master node. Why is this needed? Well, the client one needs to know whom to issue the right to, and so there needs to be some leader, or if client two is connected to any of the three nodes being master, slave one, and slave two, the right then needs to be sent first to the master. Let's say there's a, um, let's say that the right is actually issued to slave two. Slave two would then ish forward the right to the master, and then that would be forwarded um, back to the different nodes, okay? So um, that's one possibility, but we still need to have a master in the system, okay? Um, there also needs to be some sense of completion of a write before a read can happen, okay? So we wanted the read to give consistent data regardless of which replica it reads from, okay? So one way of doing this would be to devise some sort of a protocol to do a write replicate and confirm. Okay, how could you do this? Do we know of any mechanisms that would allow this? Well, um, what about something like 2PC, right? Two-phase commit. That could be a good way of doing this. Um, you know, this could be, the one above could be done through any leader election mechanism, okay? Um, and then obviously you want to read only replicated data. And so we don't want to be able to read any partial results, uh, results or data from 
um, master before um, X has been, then the change to X has been fully replicated. Okay. Um, and with the commitment scheme, that's something that we could that we could potentially do. Um, but then we also want to be able to load balance this from um, to any um, uh, to all of these nodes. So if reading the data, the data itself is quite large. It makes sense to to replicate the read requests. Okay, so you could do something where read request comes to um, comes to the master. which then forwards it um, to a slave. Okay, so maybe we have this read request actually coming in to the master and then the master kind of delegates it to a slave and then the slave actually responds with the data and there could be a lot of data. So if the request is short, well, there's no advantage to doing this, but if the data transfer takes a long time, that it does make sense to distribute this transfer load among the different slaves. Okay, so the next question is, um, is the system linearizable or sequentially consistent? So what does it mean to be linear, linearizable? It means that requests need to be served in um, the real time of the different programs. All right, that could be difficult to achieve because the different read requests could be coming in from different clients in different order and it's not clear which one would be served first. They would most likely be served by something like uh, order of arrival at the master, which means FIFO order. Okay, so, so it's not linearizable, um, but you could make it um, sequentially consistent if instead of FIFO, um, you had clients issue only one, requ one request at a time. then we would be guaranteed to serve the requests, those requests in the program order um, of each client. Okay, or you could also serve requests by uh, some timestamp such as a lamp or timestamp. By lamp or timestamp. Okay, so those are all good options, okay? Um, so how could you handle failures in the system? Well, first we would need um, some sort of a failure detector, right? How could we do it? Well, it would need to be based on some timeout and so it would be somewhat probabilistic, but um, we've seen how Raft can deal with failure detectors through timestamps, uh, timeouts and keep alives. And even though sometimes you can get a false positive, maybe that's still okay. Maybe we can still move the master around, okay? So you could elect and maintain a leader. Through something like rafts. Okay. 
Um, and then potentially you might need to roll back the changes. So if the master failed while replicating data, um, depending on how you are replicating the data, you may need to roll it back, right? So um, you could either have some sort of consensus for log changes where the events inside the logs would be the different writes okay or you could do something like two pc two phase commit or three phase commits um, which should um, handle those uh, failures um, okay so that's passive replication the other option is to use active replication Under active replication, you would have some client which would then um, issue requests to say replica manager one, replica manager two, and replica manager three. Okay. So the requests would be broadcast to these different replicas. And then once all of them accept a right, maybe this is a right, then the data would actually be changed in the system. Okay, so effectively clients take care of replication. Okay. And you could still use those same kind of methods as you used um, under the passive replication where the master replicated data. Now the same types of mechanisms would apply um, to the client. Okay. So one thing you could do, which I guess you could do in passive replication systems, is you could use um, quorums instead of write to all. Okay. That makes your system a little bit uh, more fragile, though, because quorum sometimes depend on just getting that last node. So if that last node failed, you may not be able to form a quorum. So you want some kind of a more relaxed quorum where you can have some nodes missing from it, um, right? So as an example, you could use a simple you could use a simple majority of of a quorum, um, but then you could try collect it from any node. So if you get at least a majority, you're good, but uh, maybe you would try to get something like three quarters of the nodes to actually be able to do it right. And as long as you hit majority, um, you're okay, right? You can, you can make this right. All right. Um, so then if you're using quorums, you could play with readers and writers or the numbers of readers and writers. Okay. Where the kind of requirement was that the number of readers plus the number of writers is strictly greater than n, right? But you can kind of adjust these however you like. So you could have a lot of writers um, and uh, so maybe if we have like, you know, five nodes in the system, if this is equal to five, you could have uh, something like four writers, which is a lot of writers for the system, right? Um, but to read, you would only need something like two readers, right? So as long as I can read from any two nodes, um, I can get the latest data, right? And two plus four is, is greater than five. Um, okay, so is this linearizable or sequentially consistent?
Um, so again, linearizable would be um, hard, but as long as we're doing um, as long as we're doing putting in requests one at a time by client, then that would be okay because the clients take care of their replication themselves. So this could be yes if one request at a time. Um, Okay. And that would be the same case for sequentially consistent as well, though with sequentially consistent, you could also order them by um, lamp or timestamp. Okay. The way this might work is that um, the client issues multiple requests at a time, multiple write requests at a time, but the way they can actually be read is only in the line, in the, um, uh, by the LAMP or timestamp order. So if the client issues, let's say two requests, so there's, there's one request and it takes a while to replicate while the second write request comes in, both of those would be committed, um, but uh, it wouldn't be possible for anyone to read the second update until the first update became available to some clients. So you couldn't kind of skip around um, in the commit um, in the commit order. Okay, so that's active and passive replication. They kind of worked in a very similar way. Um, it just sort of depends whether or not you have a master dealing with the replication or you have the client themselves, clients themselves doing it. All right, so that brings us to uh, the cap theorem. By Eric Brewer. In 98. Okay, so moving forward. So cap th the cap theorem is an extremely important result. It's almost like one of the main results in distributed system along with FLP. Um, and it basically states that it's impossible for a distributed system uh, to, simul to simultaneously provide consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Okay, let's write that down formally and then I'll get in there and explain. So it's impossible for a distributed system. So basically system where we have no clock synchronization. And only message passing. to simultaneously provide uh, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So consistency Uh, means that all nodes see the same data all the time. Availability uh, 
means that every request will, re will eventually receive a confirm fail response. Okay, and then partition tolerance. Means that the system continues to operate in spite of there being network failures that separate the different nodes. Oops, uh, lost my note, where's my note? Uh, so the system continues to operate. In spite of network failures. Great. So that kind of makes sense. Um, it's interesting to see why that happens, but we can kind of get a little bit deeper into what these different properties of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance mean, and how they relate to the different solutions that we've worked through in, in this class. Okay. So Um, so we can talk about safety in unreliable systems. So I guess we have talked about it. Right. Where safety was often one of the requirements for the different algorithms that we discussed. And, um, the basic idea behind this is that um, nothing bad happens if we can't reach other processors. Okay, so if our system is unreliable, we can't reach other processes. And so what we want is that for nothing bad to happen, if we can't reach others. Um, yeah, and so, you know, we've looked at kind of different pro different protocols that guarantee safety, such as Paxos, Raft, uh, 2PC, and 3PC. Okay, and all this really falls under um, consistency. Okay, so no matter what the protocol does, um, or if it's running in an unreliable system, that uh, whatever the protocol does, it doesn't end up in a state that's inconsistent. It doesn't end up in a state that's bad, right? At, at worst, it makes no progress, but it never becomes, uh, the state never becomes inconsistent. 
Okay. Um, we also talked about liveness. Uh, in unreliable systems. Um, and the idea there is that eventually something good happens. Um, something good happening usually implies um, some sort of a response to a request. Another way to talk about it is forward progress. Okay, so we've seen some trade-offs in this. Um, for example, you know, we can have uh, maybe multiple readers, but no writers, so the reading can still go on, but we can't make any changes to the data because we can't have enough nodes to form a write quorum. Uh, we've seen situations in Raft where maybe data has to be rolled back um, if there's some sequence of failures, right? And what this basically comes down to is availability. or under what conditions the system can continue to operate, um, maybe in a degraded state where we can only read data from it, but no longer write, okay? And then um, we talked about reliability. Um, which we can think of continued operation under failures. Um, and the failures here can be to nodes, links, or Byzantine. All right, and we talked about different protocols that can, that can deal with this um, in different ways and provide continued operation under sort of assumptions of node link or Byzantine failures. Um, you know, if you start missing some number of nodes, that is kind of equivalent to um, there being a partition in the network. So, so if you can't access certain nodes, you can also force the type of situation either through, you can force the type of situation either through node failures or through link failures. The effect could, could be the same. And Byzantine failures can kind of simulate both types of failures. So what this really comes down to in, in the CAP theorem is partition tolerance. So the upshot of this is that we've seen systems or we've worked with systems that can uh, provide consistency in spite of running on an unreliable system. We've seen, we've seen systems that can provide availability of data even if nodes are unreliable. And we've seen systems that can deal with certain patterns of failures uh, to provide a continued operation of the system, right? So we have systems that can provide consistency, we have systems that can provide availability, and we have systems that can provide partition tolerance. So the interesting thing that the CAP theorem offers is that none of these systems can provide all three, right? There's some trade-off that has to happen. And, um, you know, before this, people thought that, well, maybe we can't provide all three, but it turns out that you can't. You, you, you can build systems, but they kind of have to choose two out of the three. So let's look at a sketch of uh, a proof of this. So a proof sketch.
So let's say that we have a partition in the network where we have two sets of nodes. We have uh, P1, okay? And then we have a network partition and the rest of the system would be composed of P2 and P3, let's say, okay? Um, so what this means is that messages between P1 and P2 are lost. So let's assume that either of two operations exist. Where first operation is the client one writes x equals two and that write is issued into P1, okay? Or there exists an operation where client one writes um, x equals one into P1, okay? Um, so the next operation is C2, client 2, will read x uh, from or issues that request into P2, okay? So the basic problem is that if there is a partition and all these messages are lost, then P2 can't eventually distinguish between these. Okay, and by these I mean whether or not the client one writes one or two to uh, process P1. Okay, so if that's the case, what can P2 do? Um, when it receives the read request from uh, client two, okay? So it could delay the reply. Okay. So if client, so the process two need, knows that there is a partition to P1 and it's not getting any potential updates, um, then it can distinguish if the write was uh, to X was one or two it could delay the reply until network connectivity is restored. So in this case, we have during that time, no availability. Meaning that client two's read requests do not get served. Okay. Another option is that uh, P2 could reply with x equals one, could just say it's x equals one. Um, but that of course could lead to, would lead to no consistency. Because client two might read, might get one, but if the write was of two and another client issues a request to P1 to read x, they would get two and now two different clients are getting two different numbers and so we don't have consistency, okay? And the other option is client uh, process two could simply crash. Okay, but then we have no partition tolerance. All right, so so you kind of got to choose one of those. So you got to do something at P2 and you're either going to lose availability, consistency of or partition tolerance, but then 
um, you retain the other two, which is nice. Okay, so uh, as the meatloaf song goes, two out of three ain't bad. Um, and so we actually can build systems that provide two out of three. Um, it still can be hard, but um, in practice, what we really can't forfeit is partition tolerance. Um, right, partitions in the network happens all the time and um, we need to do something, right? We need to keep operating even if we can't reach some servers. So if you have you know, hundreds of servers and you can't reach one of them, um, your system has to go on and still serve requests. It can't just go down, okay? So what can you, what can you do? Well, you have to balance uh, C and A or consistency availability. Okay, so you can provide best effort availability. Where the service doesn't crash if there's a partition, but um, it may be temporarily unavailable. You may just say, hey, hold on until, until connectivity is restored. But what is more likely, what happens most oftenly, uh, more, <laughs> what happens most often, is that um, we have best effort consistency. Where we basically serve all the data. Um, in some systems that's doesn't make sense to do, but in others, like for example, Facebook, if we don't get the most up-to-date data on someone's feed or notifications, that's fine, okay? And then here, we're gonna make clients wait. All right, cool. Um, so what the type of systems that we can build um, on this are called base. Yeah. And what this stands for, for is basically available um, soft state. eventually consistent. Okay. Um, so this is of course opposed to assets. where we provide atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Here, we just kind of don't. It's mostly a best effort service and base systems, okay? So the eventually consistent part means that, well, if we wait long enough, maybe the connectivity will be restored, so we won't have a partition in the network, and then we're gonna get the latest value. But while consistency, while a partition persists, we, some people might get the latest value, some people might not. Okay, um, we have liveness, but not safety, so we will get some set of values, which means clients can make forward progress, but they're not guaranteed to get the latest set of values, um, right? The readers and writers uh, guarantees might not hold. Maybe we can only just do reads, um, right? Um, and it makes the, the design of the distributed system more complex because you could be writing data of some value and then not getting the same data back or you could be writing data and people, other people don't see it so you have to deal with that but in a lot of systems like you know um, social networks games like this is actually okay and partitions don't happen that often and people can 
deal to some extent with partitions as they happen when you're not getting the latest data. At the same time, this allows the systems to scale because you don't need to lock the system down like you would do an asset to do kind of atomic transactions. Um, atomic transactions are very expensive um, to do and you know they work in financial types of transactions, but um, even financial type systems are not really built like this, right? Even an ATM can give you some amount of money even if it can't connect, cannot connect to a bank um, right away. Right? So there's all kinds of kind of reconciliation processes that allow requests to go forward, but if there are failures, if there are partitions, if there isn't consistency, there is some process that then restores consistency, maybe rolls back some transactions um, if um, you know, if it turns out there are conflict. This is kind of on system by system basis. So again, cap theorem, two out of three, mostly systems are built to give up consistency and um, deal with it at the application layer. All right, thank you guys.